Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. At 10.20 this morning, I looked around <coughs> the church, and we had a total of about eight people here. I thought, hmm, wow. I mean, you know, typically after the, the Sunday after Easter, you have a, a pretty sharp drop-off, but I thought, wow, that is really sharp. <laughs> So I want to say thank you for those that came between 10.20 and 10.30. Thank you those that were here at 10.20, but uh, a little bit of, of, of uh, well, we'll just call it panic. <laughs> um, I haven't asked a pastor question that actually ties into um, the message today. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm starting this off. All right? This is my answer to this question. Okay? Because I know every one of you out here is going to have some insight on this. You're going to have your opinion about what this says. Okay? And, and, and we know what my grandfather used to say about opinions. Right? They're like armpits. Everybody's got a couple and they all stink. All right? So, so I'm giving you my stinky opinion. And, and deal with me in grace as I will deal with you in grace when we disagree. Okay? So the question is, do you think that Jesus will return during a Feast of Trumpets? And then in parentheses, on any given year. <coughs> to which I answer, are you talking about the second coming or the rapture? <coughs> That's my opinion. <laughs> Is it the same? No. No. Our theology, our belief is no. They are two separate, distinct events. Okay? Um, the Feast of Trumpets, we discussed a couple, actually it's about a month and a half back, and, and we're actually going to talk a little bit more about it today. <clears throat> Scripture tells us on several different occasions that the trumpet will sound. It actually says the last at the last trumpet sound. Okay, um, when we were in this subject, I told you I don't believe that to mean that it's the last trumpet that will ever sound, because it speaks of it at two distinctly different events: one that will fall before the other, and then after both of those events, it talks about the celebration of certain feasts during the millennial reign. And during those feasts, trumpets are blasted. They're sounded. So I, I don't believe that when scripture says the last trumpet sound, it's referring to the end of all trumpet sounds. Okay? I think what is being spoken there is it's the last trumpet of the blowing on the Feast of Trumpets, what, what we know as the Tekia Hagadol, if you've been paying attention to the, the messages, uh, during the Feast of Trumpets, there are a series of blasts that are blown, and they're blown in sequence 99 times, and then the 100th blow is the Tekia Hagadol, and that blast is one long, sustained sound, held as long as you can hold it. Okay, and I think that's the last trumpet that they're referring to. Because when, when Christ comes back, it's going to be with a loud, it's with a shout and a loud blast. But we know, biblically, that can't be the, the end of all trumpet sounds because there's others that come. Okay, so do I believe that Jesus will return on the Feast of Trumpets? I think it's probably very likely. <coughs> However, <coughs> let me explain. I believe that when Jesus comes in the rapture, when he appears in the air, as talked about in 1 Thessalonians, that that will be with a loud trumpet blast that, that, that makes it clear in that passage in 1 Thessalonians that there will be a trumpet blast, there will be a loud shout, and, and he will gather all of his, his believers, all of those in the body of Christ together, and, and they will be taken out of the earth. Okay? Now... If you 
follow in Scripture. Now, we're dealing with eschatology. Does everybody know what eschatology is? Yeah, it's the study of something. That's a perfect definition. <laughs> eschatology is the study of end times. Okay? Um, think, trying to think what would be the best way to proceed on this. Um, our theology at Jesus Community Church is that we believe that Christ will come back in the future at some point to take his bride out of the earth. Okay? Uh, in that view, we stand in the premillennial camp, meaning that the millennial reign, the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ when he comes and sets foot on the earth, that has not yet happened. Okay? We, we're in the premillennial camp. We teach from a premillennial understanding of Scripture. There are two other major beliefs, postmillennial and amillennial. Um, I'm not going to get into those now, uh, but I, I just want you to know we teach from a premillennial stance. Now, in the premillennial theology, um, there is a, a group that believes that the, the rapture and the second coming of Christ are two separate and distinct events. We believe this because. In certain passages, it talks about Jesus appearing in the clouds and snatching away the word rapture. It's from the Greek rapturos, and it means to snatch away, to grab up. Okay? And, and so, you, if, if you ever hear anybody say, well, rapture's not even in the Bible. <clears throat> not in English. Okay? Because in English, we translated it to being caught up or grabbed up or, or snatched away. Okay, but the word rapturos is in the Greek. So when, when Jesus comes, he's going to gather up his church and he's going to pull them out of the earth. I believe this to be anywhere from, and I, I know I'm going to step on toes here, okay? Allow me grace, I'll let you stand on mine after, okay? I believe that that will come at any point prior to, up to the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. My hope. My desire is that that would be pre-trib. I don't want to be here for any of it. However, Jesus told the believers, keep in mind, I understand they were Jews, but they were Jewish believers, that things were going to get bad. It was going to be ugly. Wars and rumors of wars. You're going to be handed over to be persecuted. Family members will be handed over by family members because they think they're doing good. It's going to get ugly. And, and I don't care how you parse it. Pre-trib, mid-trib, I, I absolutely refuse to believe post-trib scripture says that God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. wrath. So I'm sorry, but the, the, the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation, the, the Great Tribulation period, I don't believe the church can be here and God be true to his word. I'm human. I could be wrong. It's in God's hands. I trust him. But I don't think we're going to be able to pinpoint a date and say, ah, the tribulation started here. <coughs> the way that I think that date is going to be pinned is because a whole bunch of us are going to disappear. Right. Poof. Gone. Yeah. All right. Now, in this camp, we have a, I stand on a pre-wrath camp because I'm not sure what the difference is going to be prior to him coming and taking us away before the tribulation and in the middle of the tribulation. I, I really don't know where, how things are going to look except that the man of lawlessness will be revealed. Okay? If the man of lawlessness is revealed, then something that is restraining him, that is holding him back, is taken away. Okay? Now, I, I've heard teachings in, in two different camps on this as to what that is. Some people believe that that's the church. Okay, they believe that the rapture is going to come, Christ will gather his bride, the church, the body of Christ, and they'll be taken out of the way, and the man of lawlessness will be given free reign. Um, quite honestly, I don't, I don't believe that. We don't do much of a good job at restraining anything. Okay, we're, we're so busy pointing fingers at this particular sin that we ignore these sins. Um, I believe 
that because we have the Spirit of God living in us, that makes us different. I think that gives us a different perspective on what's going on in the world. Jesus told them, hey, it's going to get bad. It's going to be ugly. People's men, men's hearts are going to give out for fear. But to the believer, he says, but take heart. Take heart. Don't be afraid. Take heart because I have overcome the world. Okay? So for the believer, it, it, it's going to look ugly and bad around. It's probably going to look ugly and bad to us because it's going to be happening to us. If we are true believers, it's going to be ugly for us. But with the Spirit of God living in us, I think that's going to be a testimony to His greatness. The church has always grown better in persecution. Always. I, I don't understand it. The only thing that I can compare that to is, is the caterpillar going into the butterfly. You know, when, when, when the caterpillar goes in and it, 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 it converts into a butterfly, you know if you cut open the, the sack and, and the butterfly comes out, you've killed it. Because it's the actual struggle of breaking free of the cocoon that puts the blood working out to its, its wings and strengthens those wings so that it'll be able to fly. It's the struggle that makes the butterfly what it is. Okay? It comes out. If you cut it open and, and just pull it out, its wings are going to be malformed. They're not going to have developed properly, and it won't function the way it should. Okay? So my belief is that when God takes his bride out of the church, the bride of Christ out of the church, with it comes the Holy Spirit. Because I believe it's the Holy Spirit that is restraining the man of lawlessness. He put a line and said, you can come this far and that's it. You can't cross this. You know, that this is as far as you go. Okay, so when the church is taking out, because remember when we talked about Pentecost, what was the Pentecost? When, in, in the fulfillment of prophecy, what was Pentecost? The, church. the birth of the church. The Holy Spirit came and gave birth to a new entity that had been unknown up to that time. The Bride of Christ, the church. Okay? The only way you get into the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can come in here and sit here for 50 years. You can quote scriptures back to me. You can sing all of the songs in any given key. <laughs> but if you have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are not a part of the church of Christ. Now, don't panic. Because I'm not saying, uh, like some people believe that in order to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, you've got to speak in tongues. I think that's a flaw in Scripture. Read 1 Corinthians 11, 12, and 14. You'll understand what I'm saying. Okay? But I believe that there is, there is, Scripture makes it abundantly clear that without the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved. He is the seal of your salvation. Okay? So when the, the, the Spirit and the bride are taken out, the man of lawlessness will, will come forth. Now the thing about that is, is I don't believe that's going to be an instantaneous event. I think it's going to be somebody that the world knows, that the, that the world is going to be familiar with. It's going to be somebody, somehow, that's not going to shock the world and go, who is this guy? I could be wrong, but I think it's going to be somebody that, that people have been looking to for hope. He's going to come out and he's going to give hope because he's going to bring peace, and, and specifically peace, to the Jews. Now think about it right now. Who are giving the Jews the most grief? The, the sons of Ishmael and Esau. The Antichrist is going to have to reckon a way to, to bring together the Muslims and not just the Jews, but the rest of the world. He's going to have to answer that question. How do we reconcile these two things? When, when the Muslim teaching is that the infidel has to die. He's going to bring a way that there will be peace between... Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, Syria, all of those countries, and Israel. And the world's going to go, whew. You know why? Because they've got nukes. Did you know that? Uh, if you think about this for a moment. People that have said that they want to expunge Israel from the, the earth have nuclear weapons. We know Israel has nuclear weapons. They got them from us. Not because we sold them, because they did a little bit of clever subterfuge and they ended up with them. Okay? But they, now, if you don't think that puts the world on the edge, on the brink, and Iran spouting its hatred, and Hezbollah spouting their hatred, and all of these people spouting their hatred for Israel, and we want to wipe them from the face of the earth, and Israel saying, bring it. We got nukes too. 
You don't think that puts the world on the edge? And as it gets worse, because in all prophecy, our focus is where? Israel. Israel. It's not here. Okay? It's not here. It's in Israel. And as things speed up to the end, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse. And, and you don't think the world is going to be holding its breath while people are sitting there with their thumbs over the button. Okay? And then the man of lawlessness is going to come in and say, hey, 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 hey. And he's going to speak peace, peace. Okay? But it's all going to be deceit. So now, I, I kind of took the long way around to get back to my question. As a believer in the rapture, I believe that we will hear a trumpet sound. Um, I think it will be distinctly recognizable to the believers, the bride of Christ. I think the other people are going to hear a noise and not really be sure what it is. I, I believe this because like when Paul was walking on the road to Damascus, God spoke to him. Jesus Christ spoke to him on the road, and he heard him clearly. The other people heard something that sounded like thunder. Okay? Oftentimes when God spoke, it was received by someone as words, and to other people it was a noise. It was a sound. A lot of times it was like the rumbling of thunder. Okay, so, so I believe that it will be recognizable to the church because we're not even going to get into the ready position. I mean, we're just poof, gone. All right? So, that being said, I don't believe, I'm not convinced, let me say that, I'm not convinced that will happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Here's why. I believe the Feast of Trumpets will be th that day and that period, that will be when Christ comes physically to earth and sets foot on the Mount of Olives. Okay? And, and scripture tells us in Zechariah that he will set foot on the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of Jerusalem, and the mountain will split in half, half moving to the north and half moving to the south. All those graveyards that are, that are between the Mount of Olives and the east gate, um, uh, no problem. They're going to be pushed aside, and he's going to have a clear path to walk through in fulfillment of prophecy. Now, why do I believe that it is going to be on the Feast of Trumpets when he comes back? Because it, that occasion is for the Jew. Okay, look, look back at our spring feasts, Passover for the Jew, Feast of Unleavened Bread for the Jew, Feast of First Fruits for the Jew, Pentecost for the Jew. Now, each of these things by extension applies to us because we're inheritors of the prophecy and the promise that, that, that those held, but they happen specifically in an order to the Jewish people. Okay? I'm, I'm absolutely okay with being wrong on this. Because one of these days, we're all going to stand before God and realize how very much of it we got wrong and how great His grace is despite it. Okay? I believe that the fall feast will be specifically for the Jews as well. But as, as the spring feast for the building up to the church and the restoration of a right relationship with God and man, I believe that the fall feast will be ushered in to set the entire world right. God, because what, what is the last feast in the fall? The feast of tabernacles, tabernacles, tabernacles booths. And, and what does Revelation say? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. That's the end of it all, when God sets everything right. And he tabernacles with us. So, so I believe that some point on the Feast of Trumpets, some Feast of Trumpets, that trumpet is going to sound, and, and people are going to go, wow, that was really loud. That was louder than I've ever heard. And wham! Christ will set foot on the Mount of Olives. The armies that surround Jerusalem will be dealt with. And he will establish and move forward with God's plan to redeem, restore the world to what he intends. Okay? Why not the rapture? Because all of the spring feasts dealt specifically to the people of Israel. And then only by extension to the rest of us. Okay? It brought us into the vine. We're the wild branch plugged into the vine. I think at some point God is going to take us out of the picture and he's going to return and fulfill his promises to Israel. Okay? We're in the season of the Gentiles, folks. Thank God for that. You know? Thank God that, that he gave us a time that we could be grafted in. So, Feast of Trumpets. 
Could possibly happen at the rapture, I, I don't know. The, reason, the only reason I don't know why I specifically say at the second coming is, is just because the logic of how the spring feasts were filled specifically to the Jews. I think the fall feasts will be too because I don't think the church, the, the Gentile church and, and the Messianic Jews, I don't think they're going to be here. I think they're going to be already up with Christ. Okay, So that's, that's my two bits. Okay, I would encourage you, read. Read, 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 read. And don't just read one perspective. Okay? Look at the other perspectives. Hold them all up in light of Scripture. One of the problems that, that the Jews had when Jesus came the first time was they had selected a very careful few Scriptures that they wanted to be their Messiah. These are the Scriptures of the Messiah that's coming. He's going to deliver us from Rome. He's going to establish us again as, as the kingdom of David and Solomon. And, and everything's going to be great. We're going to be a, a mighty military power. We're going to be a mighty economic power. We're going to be independent. And everything's going to work right. And they neglected the other scriptures that said, uh, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey, the suffering servant, and, and, and beaten beyond recognition, who will atone for our sins. And, and they, they didn't look at those because that didn't fit what they thought should happen. Okay? So don't get so caught up in what you think should happen that you fail to take in account. There's a lot of scripture. There's a lot of scripture. And, and when we start picking and choosing, um, one of the reasons that I no longer highlight in my Bible and make notes in my Bible is because after 20 years of doing that, guess what parts I read? The ones that were highlighted. And, and I, would, I would get so caught up in what I highlighted and the notes that were written to the side that I couldn't see beyond to the parts that weren't highlighted. Uh, I, basically, I would kind of like blink over those. The words would go through my eyes and disappear somewhere in the void of my head. And, and then I would just get to the next part that I had highlighted. So, so I, if you do that, I encourage you. You don't need to stop. But I would encourage you. This is what I do. Okay, Have a notebook. Make notes in your notebook. Don't, don't write them in your scripture so that you don't fall into that trap of, of only going back to the same ones over and over and over and over and over again. Okay? Make a notebook. And then at different times as, as life goes on, go back and re-examine your notebook. But understand that your notebook is not the Bible. Okay? That your notebook is not the Bible. It's just insight that God has given you to the Bible. Okay? All right. So that's, that's my answer. I will leave the question up here. Um, I want to do, because we've been away from this for so long, uh, I want to do a quick recap of the feasts thus far. So if you have your Bible, open to Leviticus 23. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seat in front of you. You're in trouble. Yeah. There's one over here. <laughs> So we're going to do, just today, we're going to do a recap, get us all caught up, because we're moving into, um, we're starting to wrap up the feasts that God gave Israel. Now, we started this off, we started off with the understanding that the word feast actually is, the literal translation of that word is uh, appointed time. Okay? So, you know, we have this idea, at least I have this idea, when you're talking about a feast, I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is Thanksgiving. You know, I, I don't know how you guys did Thanksgiving, but when I was a kid, um, we started about 10.30 in the morning and mom would make Texas toast, which evidently is just toast that you cut fatter than normal toast, okay? I didn't know that. I thought it was a special toast until, you know, I was older and, and, and asked, oh, well, there's nothing special about it. It's just beer. Um, and, and then we would go on and, and we would have Auntie Pops, so that, that's your second course. And, and then after that... Um, you, you would have your bread with your auntie pasta, then you would have salad, and, and that was your, your third course. And then we would always have Italian soup. It's not the Italian wedding soup. It's, it's got a lot of Romano cheese and sausage and, and, and chicken broth in it, and, and that was your, your fourth course. And then um, after that, and, and during these, these things, you would occasionally take breaks, and all the men would watch TV, and the women would talk out at the table, and all of us kids would go outside and play football, or depending on the weather, go sledding, or play football while we're sledding, okay? And, and so then we would come back, and then we would have, because my mom comes from an Italian family, we would have lasagna, and, and that's course number five, okay? And then, then we would have Thanksgiving. 
after that was turkey and stuffing and gravy and, and potatoes and, and uh, fried feast and all that other stuff. And then after that, see, you guys wonder why I'm the size I am? <laughs> after that, there were pies galore. Pies upon pies upon pies upon pies. And, and then, at some point when you should have probably died, you say goodnight and you go to bed. Okay? That's the picture that I have when I think of the word feast. Okay? Um, I mean, just the bounty spread before you. Now, all, not all of these feasts, as a matter of fact, on some of these feasts, uh, they, were, they were not a joyous occasion where family got together and celebrated and, 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 and thought happy thoughts. Some of these were actually solemn occasions because they were being reminded of, of something beyond what, just what made them happy. Okay, so when we think of these things as feasts, I have to automatically stop my, my thought process and take my westernized specific thinking and, and change it back to what God originally intended. This is the appointed time. At this appointed time, this is what you're doing. Okay? So, having said that, um, there were four spring feasts and three fall feasts. So, uh, but, but before we get to that, um, because the idea of feast, we've so misunderstood, a lot of people discount the first feast. What's the first feast? Sabbath. The Sabbath. Uh, okay, let's, let's just take a quick look in chapter 23. I'm going to start in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. That word appointed feast is, is actually appointed times. Okay? So don't get all caught up in, in lasagna and turkey. Okay. I was 16 years old before I realized, you crazy people, you don't have monogoyt for Christmas. You guys eat ham and turkey. We had lasagna and monogoyt. And, and uh, my friend said, you know, he came to school and he said, yeah. He said, no, we had a great ham. Well, first, those two things can't exist together because there's no such thing as great ham. Okay. Uh, but why are you eating ham? Did they hate you? I mean, did you get anything for Christmas? Just ham? Because we always had Italian food. My grandmother always cooked, so, so it was always Italian food. Okay, so it wasn't a feast. Verse 3, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> You think it's important to God that we rest? Yes. Why? <clears throat> you know, how about because He did? Because in in the week of creation, He worked for six days, and then on the seventh day, Scripture is very clear. It says, "On the seventh day, He rested." Was God tired? No, no. Uh, for those of you that are, are workaholics that feel like you can't rest, um, you may be able to do it for years on end, seven days a week, uh, but, but scripturally that is not what's best for you. As a matter of fact, one of the things that, that is so uh, throughout our culture is that, that people feel guilty when they rest. They feel like they should be doing something. Now, Christy and I are, are two very distinctly different people. Um, thank God. Blue would not look good on my bald head. Uh, Christy has this amazing ability that I, I cannot, I, I, I don't understand, I don't get it. I can acknowledge it, but I can't understand it. She can be very content sitting in her chair doing nothing. And, and I, 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 try, I don't try to spoil those moments ever because she doesn't get them very often. Okay? But <clears throat> she'll be sitting in her chair. She's not reading. She's not watching something. There's no movie. There's no sermon. There's nothing going on. A lot of times she's not even really thinking. She just gets into this state that, that I, I, I can't wrap my brain around because if, if you see me sitting still, one of two things has happened. Either I've gone unconscious or I'm in deep thought. 
both of those are not good places for me a lot of times. Okay? So, but, but she has this amazing ability to just rest, to be at peace. You know, we think about this a lot in scripture, the idea of the deer panting for the water and going down and drinking and, and, and that, that still quietness that God calls us to have. Be still and know that I am God. I know God would thump my head all the time. I used to get thumped all the time by my teachers because I always sat and did this. For those of you that can't see, okay, I'm jiggling my leg. And it was one or the other was always moving. And if I finally got my leg still, I'd start doing stuff with my hands, okay? Um, I, I just, I, I, if you watch me today, I don't sit still. I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly <laughs> doing stuff. I'm, I'm, I don't like to sit still. Um, being still is something that is really hard, but it's called for from God. God has called us to set aside a day to do no work. Okay, this is this is this precedes the law. This, this comes with creation. This is the way that God ordained that things would work. That six days you're busy, and on the seventh you rest. Okay? Well, we don't get caught up in, in, in it being the Saturday, the this, this Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, because with the, the coming of Christ, with him fulfilling the law, Col Colossians tells us that, 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 hey, whether you celebrate the new moon feast or the Sabbath, do it unto God. Do it. We have freedom. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that we are going to... We, actually, Scripture tells us we're in the Sabbath rest. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. There is a rest that is coming. Hebrews tells us that there's a rest that is coming for those that believe the Sabbath rest. It's all time. Okay. Now, here's one of those weird things. Because when God created Adam, he created him to do what? Work. 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 But it was only when Adam sinned that work became evil. Okay? I don't know how it was spelled before, but I know after the curse it became a four-letter word. <laughs> okay? But on that seventh day, God, God rested and he tells us to rest. Look, if you're not resting on that seventh day, if you're busy, 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 don't be surprised when things start to break down. Because that's not how God designed this thing to work. Take a day and rest. Slow down. Calm down. Take some time. Let God... Revive your body. Refresh your body. Let, let that happen. That's the first feast. That's the first one. And it's supposed to happen once a week. Okay? So moving on. Uh, what's the second feast? Passover. Passover. Pesach. <clears throat> Excuse me. A couple of things that, that stand out. <clears throat> when God drew the people out of, of Egypt, he gave a command to Moses. <clears throat> He said, I want you to make this month your first month of the year. He, re he revised the calendar. And he said, this is the first month. And he established an order in the feast. If you look later on, and I'm not going to do all the reading. We've done the reading already in previous messages. I'll leave that to you to kind of keep up. He says that on the 10th of the first month, you are to select a lamb. You are to keep the lamb until the 14th. And during that time, you're to inspect it. You're supposed to check and make sure that it is without blemish, that it does not have any flaws. And then on the 14th, because the Jewish day starts at night, on the 14th, the evening of the 14th, the lamb for the, the individual families, because the story in Exodus is that each family was to take their own lamb. And if there were not enough people in that family to, to consume the lamb for the meal, then two families would come in together. Okay? And, and so... The evening, the lamb was slain for the individuals. Now later, as Israel became established as a nation, the next morning, which to us would be the next day, but really it's just the end of the 14th, there would be a lamb that would be slain on behalf of Israel. The high priest would, would, would do that sacrifice. Okay? Now, <clears throat> why is this important to us? Well, if you don't know, you should have been at the Seder. <clears throat> um, to a Christian we look back and we can see so very clearly in the last week of Jesus' life how he so clearly fulfilled the promise and the prophecy of the Seder, of the Passover because Jesus came into Jerusalem 
on the 10th of the first month, the 10th of Aviv, Lamb Selection Day, most likely coming in the same gate that the lambs would be driven in. Okay? He presented himself at the temple every day thereafter for examination. He was examined by the Pharisees. He was examined by the Sadducees. He was examined by the Herodians. He was examined by the people. And he was, if you read scripture, at no point did he prove it to have any flaw. And he answered all their questions. Okay? So he was examined, <coughs> excuse me, for four days. <coughs> well, then we know that the, the night they celebrated the Passover, because uh, they begin their day at sundown, he celebrated the Passover, and then that night he went to the garden, and, and he was arrested, and he was brought before Pilate, and Pilate sent him off to Herod, and Herod sent him right back. And, and, you know, if you ever get the chance, do a little bit of study on, on the man Pontius Pilate. He was not a nice person. Matter of fact, we know on at least two occasions, he was reprimanded once by Caesar for being too brutal to the Israelites. Um, he, he had a very harsh way of dealing with zealots. Uh, he killed them. And just to make sure he didn't miss anybody, he killed anybody they were connected to. Okay, so he was not a nice man. But Pilate saw something that the people of God, the children of Israel, did not see. Even though he didn't have the scriptures, he didn't have their history, he didn't have their background, he understood that Jesus was innocent. And he did everything he could to set Jesus free. And, and we may think this a brutal thing, but he had Jesus scourged, but that he did that in the hopes that that would be enough. And, and then he could just go on about his life. Okay, so Jesus died. So he, we, we know from scripture that he died. He was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning. Guess what happens at 9 o'clock in the morning on Passover? Remember that lamb I was talking about? The lamb that was sacrificed on behalf of the nation? That's when that lamb was sacrificed. Okay, we know that from the sixth hour, which would be noon, to the ninth hour, which would be 3 o'clock, darkness covered the whole land. And then we know at 9 o'clock, right about that time, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, it is finished, and he gave up his spirit. Guess what was going on at 6 o'clock? Guess what was going on that night? That's the, the other sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. And then he was taken down, he was put into a tomb, and we have the answer to our Passover. See, Passover is no longer just a Jewish holiday. It's a holiday for us. We change the name. We're crazy people. We're so, we're, we're, oh man, we have Easter. We have Good Friday. We call it Good Friday, which is really a weird name because this is a horrific, it's probably one of the most horrific days in the history of the world because the very creator of that world died. And then we go for three days and, and we have this, this uncertainty, this doubt, this what's going on. And on the third day he rose and, and the angels came and rolled the stone away so we could get in to see he was no longer in there. Not because he needed somebody to get, you know, Jesus wasn't knocking on the rock going, hello, let me out. He, he walked through. We know that because he appeared in the midst of the disciples. The doors were locked. Okay. So the, the stone was rolled away and he was raised. What, what, uh. Well, let, let's back up. So the first feast, Sabbath, second feast, Passover. Right after Passover comes the um, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, the Pharisees saw this as one long feast, and it started on the day of Passover, which they considered a Sabbath day because it was a holy convocation, and they were not to do any regular work. And then it went on for an additional seven days. So they saw Passover as the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, unleavened bread, we talked about in Scripture, in almost every case that, that leaven is used in the Bible, in an allegory or an illustration, it is used to represent sin. sin. And so uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, all the leaven had to be cleaned out. Uh, as Paul says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Because you put leaven in, you can't get it back out. Once it's in, it's in for good. Okay? So, so what does this mean for us, the, 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 the feast of unleavened bread? Jesus fulfilled this because he was without sin. 
He was tempted in every way that we were tempted, we are tempted, and yet he was without sin. Now, now, try to bend your brain around that for just a minute, because we understand that sin isn't just what we do, it's what we think. So Jesus not only didn't do anything wrong, he didn't think anything wrong. And then you add on top of this, the, the, the laws that, that were given. The, the customs, the traditions, all of these things that, that were expected of a Jew, he fulfilled all of those perfectly. Wow. Uh, man, I can't hardly get from my bedroom to the bathroom without blowing it. You know, I wake up in the morning, and before my feet hit the floor, I've probably already blown it. Okay? So Jesus... Being absolutely without sin, he is our unleavened bread. As a matter of fact, the, the word matzah that, that we get for unleavened bread, it actually means sweet. Okay, It's sweet bread. It's without the sourness of, of your leavened bread. Um, so then Jesus fulfills not only Passover, but he also fulfills the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But, but see, right here, there's, there's, there's another feast that's stuck right in there. And it's what? First fruits. First fruits. Okay, we look at this and we go, okay, I don't really, I, I, I'm not a farmer. I've never been a farmer. As far as I know, I'll never be a farmer. I, I, I've given up saying I won't do that because I swore for years I would never live in a mobile home and God put us in a mobile home. And I was so glad that God put us in a mobile home because it was better than living on the street. And so I don't, I don't tell God I, I won't do that anymore because he, he does things just to prove me wrong. Okay. What is the, the saying? Uh, man plans and God laughs. Okay, God, God gets a lot of laughs out of me. All right. So we have this feast of first fruits, and this was to show Israel's dependence and trust in God. And, and this would be the barley harvest this early in the spring. This would be the barley harvest. That's the first crop that ripens in the spring. And, and they would set aside... A portion of it as the first fruits and they would bring that in and it would be a celebration they would bring it to the temple and and the first fruits would be waved uh, before the the altar as a wave offering to God now this this was a, a an opportunity not just to be obedient to God but to show their faith in God because they're taking the first of everything that they get and they're bringing it to him okay so how does this even work with Jesus, first fruits. As far as I know, he wasn't a farmer. You know, Scripture says he was the son of a carpenter. So we would imagine that at some point he was a carpenter. And, and what's really cool is if you, you really look into that and do a little bit of research, there's a very strong argument to be made that he wasn't a carpenter like he made chairs. Uh, he was actually a stonemason. He actually worked stone because the, the, the word used can mean either. And the area that he lived in, it wouldn't make a lot of sense to have carpenters because they, had, they didn't have a lot of woods. They had stone. So it's, it's very likely that he was the son of a stonemason. Again, one of those things that we bypass because we're not really paying attention to what's going on in the original language. So um, probably not a farmer. Um, he understood farming because he used that in a lot of his illustrations. But Paul gives us a glimpse to something that we probably wouldn't see of ourselves. Because in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul talks about Jesus being the first fruits from the dead. He, he's not only fulfilling that, that prophecy, but he is also, um, he, he, is the, he's, he is the first fruit. He's the, the first of the resurrection from the dead. He is the first one to ever be resurrected from the dead, not to die again. You know, Lazarus was raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, we find out just a couple chapters after he was raised from the dead, uh, he's already got a hit out against him. The religious leaders are saying, hey, we've got to take this guy out because with him walking around telling the story of being dead, people are starting to believe Jesus. And, and if we can take him out, then they, then they don't have anything to stay with Jesus. So, so not only was Jesus marked, but Lazarus was marked. Wow. You've got to wonder how Lazarus felt when he heard Jesus say, come forth. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have been happy, I don't think. Man, because when this life is done, I don't want to come back. Man, when, when, when we're in glory, to be in the presence of God, 
I don't want to come back here. Sorry, folks. I'll wait for you. But I don't want to come back here. So Jesus <coughs> dies. He's killed. He goes into the tomb. And then in fulfillment of prophecy, uh, the prophecy of Jonah, three days in the belly of the whale, three days in the belly of the earth, he comes out. He is the first fruit from the dead. And our belief, our hope, not a hope that we think, gosh, maybe this will happen. This hope is we can't wait for this to happen. Is that as he rose, we also too will be raised. Okay, so here's, here we've got the Sabbath that Jesus fulfilled and that he has given us a Sabbath rest. We no longer have to work to become righteous before God. Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus fulfilled the Passover, the Paschal Lamb. He was slain for our sins. He fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread by going to the cross without sin. And he fulfills the Feast of first fruits by being the first raised from the dead to never die again. <coughs> because of his resurrection, we can say, Death, where is your sting? Bring it. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I don't look forward to the process of dying, but boy, that moment when all of this goes and all that he has promised comes, I can't wait for that moment. I can't wait. So we see the spring feasts all being fulfilled. Now, as I said in, in the Ask the Pastor question, these were all fulfilled specifically in Israel, specifically unto the Jews, and then by extension, because of the goodness and the greatness of God's heart, extended to us. So those of us that were caught in sin, he's our Passover lamb. Those of us that were caught in sin, he went there perfect on our behalf. Those of us that, that before had no hope, man, when we went to the grave, it was over. We were done. Bad news from there on. He has given us a hope to look forward to. This is why I believe in, this, in the fall feasts, it will happen specifically to the people of Israel. So in the fall feasts, now we, we go through the summer, and we get to the month of Tishri. Does anybody know what number month that is? What, what number? Oh, I just told you. Seven. It's the seventh month. Okay? Um, actually, the, the feasts in the seventh month, actually, the preparation for them began in the sixth month, the month of Elul. Okay. And that month was, was given to Israel. They, they took this as a warning to take that month and spend it in reflection and repentance to, to make themselves right before God because the Day of Atonement was coming. And, and on the Day of Atonement, man, if you weren't right with God, your name got put in a book that, that sent you a place you didn't want to go. Okay. But on the first of Tishri, we have the Feast of Trumpets. Um, Hag uh, Tekiah, the Jews have changed the name to Rosh Hashanah, which means uh, the, the uh, first of the year, the head of the year. Okay, um, because of how significant these three feasts were and, and are, um, the, the Jews actually made the month of Tishri the first month in their calendar year for their civil calendar. Now, according to their religious calendar, they still keep uh, Aviv or Aviv, Nisan, as, as the first month of the religious calendar, and everything goes off of that, but... Um, Tishri, uh, the, the, the Rosh Hashanah, um, there's a couple of significant events that they believe happened on that day. One, they believe that uh, um, God created the earth on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, I need to back up. I need to, I need to address something that I, I missed before. Uh, so well, I'm going to stop on the Feast of Trumpets because I need to back up to Pentecost. I blew it. Um, I need to share with you uh, something of huge significance that happened on um, Pentecost or Shavuot. Um, and I, 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 it was so important that I, I typed it up in a separate note so that I wouldn't lose it in my place when I'm going through my notes. I typed it up in a separate note. And that note didn't make it out when I pulled it out of my folder and, and I missed it. And, and thankfully, uh, Jeannie reminded me um, Pentecost 
comes 50 days after um, the Passover. Okay? The Jews celebrated Passover as the day they were set free from Egypt, the, the day that they actually got to walk out. And then 50 days later, they'd already crossed the Red Sea, they'd gone down Sinai, they went uh, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, they went to Mount Sinai, and, and on the 50th day, the day of Pentecost, God gave them the law. Okay? You remember the story? Uh, they're all gathered at the foot of the mountain. God tells Moses, I'm going to come down, I'm going to speak to you so they'll know that you are my voice. And, and God comes down and speaks to him. And Israel goes, hey, that was great, but you know what? We'll trust you with this. Don't let him do that again. Man, that was scary. That was, that was just, you know, we're not ready for that. And so God called Moses to come up the mountain. And he was going to give him the law. And he was gone for 40 days. Um, receives the law. And, and he comes down from the mountain. And Joshua, who had gone up halfway, meets him. And they're going down. And Joshua says, hey, I hear the sound of battle. And Moses goes, no, that's not the sound of battle. That's the sound of celebration. And, and he comes into the camp and, and what's going on. The people got... Uh, yeah, they, 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 you know, they say idle hands are the devil's workshop. Hands that make idols are the devil's workshop. And, and they, they got idle and they didn't know what to do. Moses was gone. He wasn't coming home. Uh, he wasn't bringing back everything that he promised. So they, they spoke to Aaron and they said, make for us a God that we can worship. And so he gathers their gold and he throws it in the fire. And I don't know what happened. Out came a calf. Hmm. It was crazy. It was the most ridiculous thing. Oh, gosh. Um... And, and when Moses comes down, they're worshiping the golden calf. And, and then uh, we, we see uh, there's actually an insert, there's a pause in here, a parenthetical statement that takes about eight chapters. And then we see that as, as Moses is coming into the camp and he sees what's going on, he, he calls out that any that are faithful to come to him. And the tribe of Levi came to him. And he said, gird up yourselves with a sword and go through and slay those in the camp that are worshiping this idol. Okay. And, and so here he comes with the, the, the tablets and, and he breaks the tablets and because he knows the covenant's already broken, Israel already blew it. Okay. And, and then he says, go get them boys and, and uh, guess what happens? 3,000 people died. 3,000 people gave up their lives. Now, on, on Pentecost, there's a couple of things that, that Pentecost is significant for. But one of the things uh, that, that the rabbis teach is that the day of Pentecost was not just the day that God gave Israel the law, uh, but that it was also the day that God struck all of the inhabitants of the earth at the Tower of Babel. Okay? And, and that... Uh, they were, you remember the story, they were going to build this huge edifice and they were going to go up and exalt themselves, kind of like what, what Lucifer did, I'm going to exalt myself above the heavens, and, and, and they're building this thing, and God comes down and he strikes them, and, and all of a sudden, um, I, I don't know why he had to change their languages, because Christy and I have proven repeatedly that even speaking the same language, we don't communicate, Okay. Um, we were talking the other day, I was talking to her about the haircuts that she gives Thaddeus and I, um, and, and I was trying to explain to her how Thaddeus's hair, I thought, was a little bit too long on the top. I think you need to, to kind of grade it up a little bit, you know, because of the, it was like a mop. <laughs> and and, and she's, I said, so what, what guard do you use? And she said, I don't use a guard. Yeah, you do. Well, uh, I use the same guard. I, I use a one all around. I said, there's no way you can use a one all around because I can see it's shorter here, it's longer here. There's no way you can use a one. She said, yes, I only use a one. Christy, you cannot be using a one. <coughs> Look at his head. She goes, who are you talking about? So I'm talking about Thaddeus. He goes, oh, I thought you were talking about you. I use the same thing on your head. I use a different one on his. But we went back and forth for like three minutes. <laughs> Same words, same language, two completely different understandings. But God struck them in the languages and, and they dispersed. Okay, so I want to read to you just a couple of notes. Um, so this takes place 50 days after the Passover lamb. Um, this happened at the top of Mount Sinai. Fire capped the top of the mount. Uh, there was wind, fire, and thundering. 
Uh, the, the word for thundering there is kolot. That's a Hebrew word. That's a, a word for voices or languages. Um, <clears throat> people were kept away from the fire. The whole mountain quaked. God came down. Israel became a nation. Now, up to this point, they were a people. God delivered them out of Egypt, but they weren't a, a they didn't have their own currency, they didn't have their own laws, they didn't have their own rulers. It's at this point that they become a nation. And um, Israel received the Torah, the law. The law was written on tablets of stone. Um, now let's jump forward to Acts chapter 2. I got to do the math on this. There was a note here, and I apologize, I didn't check it. Uh, if this number is right, this would have been approximately. Actually, this says that, that it should have been uh, the Earth, the, the, the Earth, not the people of Israel, the Earth's 80th jubilee. If you want to see what, uh, why that's significant, look up the year of jubilee. Okay, um, I'm not going to get into that now. So. Acts chapter 2 takes place after the death of the Passover lamb, the, the one and only that we need, Jesus Christ. It takes, takes place 50 days um, after the spiritual exodus from sin. It happens at the top of Mount Zion. Uh, tongues of fire capped the heads of the people that were present. There was a rush of wind, there was fire, and there was kolot. Voices, languages. Fire came to the people. The people were reckoned as drunk. God came down. The church was born. Just as Israel was born as a nation, the church was born. Uh, as they were called the kingdom of priests, we are now called the kingdom of priests. 3,000 people were slain at the giving of the law of Moses. How many people were saved? 3,000. You think there's anything in Scripture that's there by accident or without purpose? You look closely enough. God opens your eyes enough, and you see that everything in there is there with a purpose. It's our job to seek out what that purpose is. Okay? I'm going to end there, uh, but I really wanted you to see at Pentecost that it's not only the birth of the church. It's not only God bringing into to being something that wasn't before, um, but, but the, that it correlates directly to the giving of the law, almost point for point, going down the list. And, and it's an amazing thing, because as God called for himself and a people to be his own, at, at, at Pentecost, he calls us to be a people that's his very own. Uh, Peter calls us a, a, a chosen generation, a holy people, a royal priesthood, uh, and, and peculiar. Peculiar, not like we're weird, although, you know, we're weird, I own it. Um, but 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 different, set set apart, unique from the rest of the world. Okay, so uh, next week I'll touch just a little bit on the Feast of Trumpets, and then we'll get into Yom Kippur, the the High Holy Day. Uh, this this is kind of where it's at, folks. This is kind of what everything is building up to, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. All right. So, um, Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for your insight for your teaching, Father, that, that we can look into your word, and Father, with your Holy Spirit, it opens our eyes, and we can see, and read, and understand, and comprehend. And I thank you, Father, that the, the, the more we read, the more your Spirit reveals to us. I ask God that you would give us the spirit of understanding, that, Father, you would give us ears to hear, and Father, that you would protect us from hearts that would be hard. I ask God that you would accomplish your purposes in us, and through us, Father, that we would be fit tools for your hand. We bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen.